Dr. Vaishnavi, your EMP faculty on the Prep Ladder platform. This is an image based session for INICT, the part two of the prior session. Unfortunately, because of some issue during the live class, I am doing this as a recorded session. But nevertheless, uh, every topic, uh, if it is understood well, is the most important aspect of it. And uh, holding that in mind, we are doing this recorded session so that you don't waste your time during the technical issues that happened during the class. At least you will be able to go through this uh, recorded version very quickly. So this is going to have 25 important questions. Yesterday, we have done about 25. So this is going to have another 25 important topics from where we are going to have discussion. So without wasting any further time, let's begin the class. So true about... Uh, uh, true about the condition are all except this condition is aggravated uh, this condition occurs due to vocal abuse and aggravated by reflux diagnosis is made upon biopsy on microscopy it shows hyperkeratosis it can be caused because of intubation now all of you need to look at the image first and once you look at the image you should get your diagnosis so if your image is showing you hyper a uh, plastic epithelium on one side and a corresponding depression on another side it is suggestive to you of pachyderma laryngitis also called as contact ulcer also called as kissing ulcer so pachyderma laryngitis is a condition where you see hypertrophic epithelium on one side and this hypertrophic epithelium is pressing on the other side and as a result it is compressing on the other side you are having a depression it is not a true breach in the epithelium it is just a depression so it's not a true ulcer it is a pseudo ulcer so here you get not a true ulcer it is pseudo ulcer it occurs due to vocal abuse and it is aggravated by reflux diagnosis is made upon biopsy where you see hyperkeratosis and acanthosis these are two very important features and on microscopy, you will see hyperkeratosis is right answer and can be caused because of intubation is wrong because intubation granulomas are bilateral and this is not unilateral. Whereas unilateral hypertrophic epithelium with a ulcer on the other side is suggestive to you of pachyderma laryngitis, contact ulcer also called as kissing ulcer. So that was the first question. Now let us go to the second one. The instrument is used for, what is the name of this instrument? So basically this is an otoscope. And this otoscope is having a pneumatic attachment. So what is this used for? It is used for segalization. So what is the uses of this particular instrument? Is it used to visualize the tympanic membrane? It is used to administer powdered medication in the canal, used to elicit brown sign, all of the above are true. So if you understand this, yes, of course, through the otoscope, you will be able to visualize the tympanic membrane is a true statement. Now, if I insert the otoscope into the external auditory canal and if I inflate, so if I inflate the cuff, the pressure will help in dispersing powdered medication through the entire external auditory canal. So when I want to give a powdered medication for any otitis external or any medical diseases of the external ear, to disperse that medication into the ear canal, I can use this because when I inflate the cuff, the powder will go and disperse and, uh, you know, get the sub... Uh, get some uh, dispersed into the external auditory canal so it is used for administering powdered medication as well now if there is a tumor of the middle ear like say there is a glomus tumor now if you increase the pressure in the external auditory canal by inflating the cuff the pressure in the middle ear will also increase and when the pressure increases and if you have a glomus tumor the tumor will vibrate vigorously and become pale so this sign is called as brown sign so brown sign is when the red tumor becomes pale we call that sign as brown sign so is this used to elicit brown sign yes so the correct answer is all of the above are true. So very importantly, an otoscope with a pneumatic attachment which is used for segalization is the in uses of this instrument. Of course, is it used for doing a fistula test? Yes, it is also used for performing a fistula test. So normally there is no communication between the middle ear and inner ear. But if there is a communication, the pressure in the middle ear can go to the inner ear to cause vertigo and nystagmus. So that test where on increasing the pressure in the external auditory canal, the pressure goes to the middle ear and to the inner ear causing nystagmus. We call that as fistula test. So this is also used for doing a fistula test. Now let us go to the next instrument. True about this instrument is it is a Higginson syringe. It can elicit fistula test, cannot be used for removal of a vegetable foreign body. All of the above are true. 
So what is true? Okay, so I think most of you would have got the answer for by now. So the instrument that has been shown to you is called as the Simpson's oral syringe. It is not your Higginson syringe. It is called as the Simpson's oral syringe. It is not used for eliciting fistula test, but it is used for eliciting caloric test. So what is caloric test? With this instrument, if I irrigate hot water or cold water in the external auditory canal, the thermal currents will go to the middle ear. And if the thermal current stimulate the lateral semicircular canal, the patient will experience nystagmus and vertigo. So this test is called as caloric test where temperature changes are used for eliciting the vertigo and nystagmus. And how do we do the temperature changes? By using warm and cold water with the help of the syringe which is called as the Simpson's oral syringe. So it is Higginson syringe is false, used for fistula test is false cannot be used for a vegetable foreign body. Typically, you won't do syringing for a uh, vegetable foreign body because the vegetable can swell. It is a hygroscopic foreign body and hygroscopic foreign body will swell whenever they come in exposure or contact with water. So, of course, you will not use this for vegetable foreign body. So, the true statement is cannot be used for a vegetable foreign body or a hygroscopic foreign body. This cannot be used. Now look at the next question. This procedure requires the use of mirror, tongue depressor, bowl or a mouth gag. So the image is showing you an instrument which is having a bend. It is not straight. So when it is having a bend, we call this instrument as St. Clair Thompson Posterior Rhinoscopic Mirror. So name of this instrument is St. Clair Thompson Posterior Rhinoscopic Mirror. So this St. Clair Thompson posterior rhinoscopic mirror is used to perform a procedure called as posterior rhinoscopy. So when we do a posterior rhinoscopy, the aim is to visualize the nasopharynx and the posterior part of the nose in the mirror. Now if I just see directly from outside without depressing the tongue, the oropharyngeal space would be not narrow, limiting me the view of the nasopharynx in the mirror. But if I will take a tongue depressor and depress the tongue, it will widen the oropharyngeal space, giving me the better view of the nasopharynx and the posterior end of the nasal cavity in the mirror. So what are the two instruments am I using here? Am I, am I using the tongue depressor? Yes. And am I using the mirror? Yes. So both of these instruments are used for performing posterior rhinoscopic examination. So for posterior rhinoscopy, you require tongue depressor and you require a mirror. Okay, now identify the eminence showed by the arrow in the CT image given below. The bulge is the surgical landmark for any surgery to the middle cranial fossa. This is due to, so they are giving you something very peculiar. You can see here there is a snake eye appearance. There are two dots on the petris part of the temporal bone. This is due to sputum cochlea, superior semicircular canal or the lateral semicircular canal. Now, whenever you see the CT scan or any other scan for that matter, understanding the anatomy or the anatomical structure becomes very important. Now, the structure that has been the structure that has been pointed to you is the petrous part of the temporal bone. So typically in the petrous part of the temporal bone, we have the inner ear structures. It could be the vestibule, it could be the cochlea or it could be the semicircular canals. Now why is it not scutum? What is scutum? Scutum is nothing but your outer attic wall. <clears throat> It is present near the external auditory canal. So if we take this as the external auditory canal, this piece of the bony part of the external auditory canal, which is near the attic or the epitympanum, we call that as scutum. So are we talking of external ear structures, middle ear structures or inner ear structures in the scan? We are talking about inner ear structure that has been pointed because we know we are being questioned about the bone that is the petrous bone. So can the, this be scutum? No. Scutum is near the external ear, so this cannot be the scutum. Now cochlea. We know cochlea is nail shaped. So will it resemble like at least some turns can we see? Rotatory turns or a snail shaped structure? We don't see anything that is nail shaped, so this cannot be cochlea. 
Then we have two canals. What canals could this be? Either superior or lateral. Now typically remember if you get a snake eye appearance. So whenever we get a snake eye appearance, it is suggestive to you of superior semicircular canal. Then you would ask me, ma'am, how would a lateral semicircular canal look like? So if you see, this is like a signet ring, right? So signet ring appearance is that of the lateral semicircular canal. So signet ring appearance is lateral semicircular canal. And snake eye appearance is that of the superior canal. So if you get a snake eye appearance, superior semicircular canal, signet ring appearance, then it is your lateral semicircular canal. So this is how you're going to identify on CT scan how a superior canal and how a lateral canal will look like. <clears throat> okay, so that was about the CT. Now look, let's look at one of the recent uh, surgeries that has been, that has come to ENT and what we commonly are performing these days and where you could expect questions from. All the following are early complications of implant sh surgery shown except facial palsy, face disturbances, device extrusion or CSF leakage. So basically you need to know what are the structures we are talking about. So you can see here we have got an external component, we have an internal component. From the internal component we have an electrode array that is inserted into the cochlea. So we see this electrode is going into the scalar tympani of the cochlea and this implant that has been shown to you is nothing but your cochlear implant. Now for doing this procedure of cochlear implant, we use a root. What is that root called as? The root is called as posterior tympanotomy root. <clears throat> so the name of the root is posterior tympanotomy. What is posterior tympanotomy? Tympano means middle ear. Tommy means opening. Posterior tympanotomy is we are opening the middle ear from the posterior root, not from your external auditory canal. We are not using the conventional root. We are going through the mastoid to reach the middle ear, which is, we, which is why we call it as posterior tympanotomy. Now to perform posterior tympanotomy, we go into a recess. That recess is called as facial recess. So what are the boundaries of the facial recess? Very importantly, if you see, the facial recess is bounded by vertical portion of the facial nerve. This is the branch of the facial nerve that you see as the corda tympani. So name is suggesting you the answer, facial recess. In the branches of the facial nerve, the recess is there that is called as the facial recess. So this is the vertical segment of the facial nerve, corda tympani nerve and fossa incubus above. So this space we call it as facial recess. Now if we remove the bone from the facial recess, we are able to see the middle ear structure. So this is your stapes and the oval window. Below that, this structure that you see is called as a round window. So are we approaching the middle ear from the mastoid? We are coming from the mastoid, opening the bone and reaching the middle ear. Hence, it's called as posterior tympanotomy. So here we insert the electrodes of a cochlear implant through the round window membrane and it goes to the cochlea. So when the electrodes go to the round window into the cochlea, we call it as cochlear implant surgery. So when I'm doing this surgery, could there be a possibility of the vertical portion of the facial nerve? Yes. Could there be a possibility of injury to the corda tympani nerve? Yes. And could there be dislocation of incus? Yes. All of these three could happen. So, corda tympani injury, facial nerve injury, incus dislocation can be complications of a cochlear implant surgery, which can be early complications. So, facial palsy, taste disturbances, CSF leakage. CSF leakage is nothing but perilymph leakage. And device extrusion is not a common complication that we see. And even if it is there, it's not an early complication at all. So the answer is, it is usually not seen that there is a device extrusion. What is CSF leakage? So we know that the scalar tympani is covered with round window. So when I make a hole for inserting the electrode into the scalar tympani, the perilymph in the scalar tympani may leak out and if the perilymph leaks out from the scalar tympani, we call it as a perilymph fistula also called as a CSF leak. <clears throat>
So this could also be an early complication when we are trying to insert the electrode into the scanner tympanite. So all the three could be complications. Device extrusion is usually not seen because we actually make a hole in the temporal bone and put it inside and secure it with sutures. So device extrusion is usually never seen or extremely rare and if, even if it does occur, it is never an early complication, it can be a delayed complication. And the question is asking us about early complications, okay. So that is about your uh, cochlear implant surgery, posterior tympanotomy and facial research. All the three have been understood in one slide. Okay, so in right middle ear pathology, the test results shown would be two. So they're doing some clinical test over here and asking you if there is a right middle ear pathology, where would the sound go? Would it be normal? Would it go to the right? Would it go to the left? Or would it be central? So right middle ear pathology, the sound will get lateralized to the deceased side. Why? Because whenever we are talking of a middle ear pathology, we are talking about conductive hearing loss. And in conductive hearing loss, what will happen to Weber's test? This test that is being shown to you is a Weber's test because the tuning fork is kept on the vertex or in the midline on the bone. So when we keep a tuning fork in the midline on the vertex or on the forehead or on the knee, on somewhere in the midline, we will see that in conductive hearing loss, the sound will go towards the deceased side and sensory neural hearing loss will go towards the opposite side. So the Weber's test, the sound will get lateralized towards the same side or deceased side. So which is the deceased side? It is the right side. So Weber will go towards the right. Since the right middle ear pathology is having the disease, which conductive pathology, the Weber's will go towards the right. So that is your answer. Okay. The test is used for the pathology, identifying pathologies of. So they're showing you some electrode being placed in the external auditory canal. This electrode is giving you sound impulses. The sound impulses are going and hitting the tympanic membrane. Some of the impulses are getting absorbed in the middle ear and some amount of impulses are getting reflected back. The reflected impulses are taken and sent to a machine or a computer sort of a system that will give you graphs. So what is this test used for identifying pathologies of the external ear, of the middle ear, of the mastoid air cell or the inner ear? So this test that has been shown to you is called as impedance audiometry. So the name of this test is impedance audiometry. This impedance audiometry consists of two tests. The first test is called as tympanometry. So tympano means middle ear, metry means measurement. So the test that we are seeing here is tympanometry. So tympano means middle ear, metry means measurements. So this is a test used for identifying the pathologies of the middle ear. So how do we identify the pathologies of the middle ear? Because when we give a sound, how much amount of sound is getting absorbed, how much amount of sound is getting reflected back, is understood by identifying the vibratory pattern of the tympanic membrane. So if the middle ear pressures are equal to that of the external auditory canal, meaning the pressure across the canal and the middle ear are the same, the tympanic membrane will vibrate at its maximum. If not, there will be reduced mobility of the tympanic membrane. So we will understand the middle ear status by visualizing the tympanic membrane mobility, by identifying the pressures and by doing graphs which are called as tympanograms. So on tympanograms we can get A, AS, AD, B and C. All of you I am sure that uh, uh, these graphs you all are very clear with so I am not going to go into these graphs. A is normal graph, AS is otosclerosis, AD is discontinuity of ossicle, B is fluid and C is negative pressure. All these five graphs, graphs are suggested to you of a middle ear disease. So the impedance audiometry is a test done for identifying middle ear pathologies. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Indications for the implant is, so they have given you another sort of an implant and they're asking you what is the indication of this implant. Is this used for bilateral profound sensory neural hearing loss, bilateral mixed hearing loss, external auditory canal atresia, none of the above. <clears throat> so what you're seeing here is called as a bone anchored hearing aid. So bone anchored hearing aid is nothing but Baha. So the name of this is called as bone anchored hearing aid, also called as Baha. So the name itself is giving you the answer. 
the hearing aid is anchored to bone as simple as that so you can see there is a small titanium screw that has got integrated with this squamous temporal bone over that you have got a receiver so this is a one time surgery where you will put the screw in the squamous temporal bone and wait for it to get osteo integrated with the surrounding bone once it has got osteo integrated over that you will put an abutment and a processor that is going to receive the sound this sound is going through the bone we know bone conduction uses only sensory neural pathway for its conduction it doesn't use conductive pathway at all so bone anchored hearing aid the sounds will go directly to the inner ear they will not travel through your external ear and your middle ear so sounds will not travel through the external ear middle ear they will go to inner ear so if there is a external ear pathology or a middle ear pathology can i use this hearing aid of course yes because the sound is bypassing the external ear and middle ear and since it's going to inner ear we can use in external ear pathologies can we use this for bilateral profound sensory neural hearing loss no why you should be asking me so if there is a unilateral snhl meaning if one sided there is a sensory neural hearing loss the sound will not go on to the same cochlea but can the sound go to the opposite cochlea via the skull bones yes and so the opposite cochlea if it is functional we are talking of unilateral snh one cochlea is abnormal one cochlea is functional so the sound can still go from the diseased side to the normal cochlea and from there it can be heard so it is used for unilateral snhl not for bilateral snhl can it be used for bilateral mixed hearing loss again the indication for bilateral mixed hearing loss is very very less or limited because the cochlea on both the sides are dysfunctional at least one cochlea has to be functional for for baha to be functional so you cannot use for mixed loss but can you use for external ear pathologies middle ear pathologies of course yes because it, the sound is bypassing the external ear and middle ear and going to the inner ear so the answer is external auditory canal atresia it can also be used for unilateral profound sensory neural hearing loss but not for bilateral profound sensory neural hearing loss so this is how a baha function so if i put a baha on one side say the right side the sound will go directly to the cochlea of that side and from there to the brain so can it be used for external ear and middle ear pathologies yes but if there is a unilateral sensory neural hearing loss they hear the there is a severe to profound loss on one side but on the other side the cochlea is normal and functional the sound can travel to the opposite side and from there to brain so unilateral profound loss okay external ear abnormalities okay middle ear abnormalities okay but can it be used for bilateral loss if it is a bilateral loss the sound cannot be transmitted and hence it's not for bilateral mixed or bilateral profound snhl it can be used only for conductive hearing loss patients or unilateral snhl patients not for bilateral snhl patients so that was about the indications of baha okay the test shown is used in the diagnosis of benign paroxysmal positional vertigo which is nothing but your bppv is it used for vestibular neuritis menias disease acoustic neuroma so you can see here a test being performed this test where the head is turned towards one side and the patient is made to lie down with the head hanging from the edge of the table and then you are looking for vertigo and the appearance of nystagmus in the eye we call this test as dix halpite test so the name of this test is dix halpite test so dix halpite test is a test done for a condition which is called as benign paroxysmal positional vertigo it is the diagnostic test so what is happening in this bppv there is displacement of otolith from the crista ampullaris so we have the crista which is the 
receptor in the ampullated end of the semicircular canal and overlying that we have small crystals of calcium carbonate so if they get displaced and if the otolith enters the semicircular canal duct it will result in vertigo and nystagmus and how do we diagnose this which is the diagnostic test it's a dick sulfide test now how do we treat this condition we have to reposition the otolith back into the uh, ampullated end of the semicircular canal where it opens in the utricle. So for that we have to do a canalolith or otolith repositioning maneuver. So what is it called as? Canalolith repositioning maneuver also called as Epley's maneuver. So what is the name given to this maneuver? Epley's maneuver. Canalolith repositioning maneuver also called as your Epley's maneuver. So, treatment is by at least diagnosis is by Dick's hand by test. Okay, let's see the next image. True about the image is it's an abnormal communication between the inner ear and outer ear. It chiefly presents as discharge from the ear. Audiometry demonstrates a conductive hearing loss. Surgical intervention is the only definitive treatment. Now you have to look into the CT scan to get an appropriate answer to all the, uh, you know, all the pointers given to you in the options. So first of all, if you see, I have told you a signet ring's appearance is suggestive to you of which canal, lateral semicircular canal. So if this is your inner ear, can I say this cavity that you see is the middle ear? Yes. Now, don't you see there is obviously some defect here communicating the middle ear with that of the inner ear? Yes. So, this is suggestive of a perilymph fistula. At what level there is a perilymph fistula? At the level of lateral semicircular canal. So, there is a perilymph fistula at the level of lateral semicircular canal. So, is this an abnormal communication between your inner ear and outer ear? No, it's an abnormal communication between your inner ear and middle ear, not the outer ear. Okay, so the first statement is false. It chiefly presents to you as discharge from the ear. No, because the lateral semicircular canal has got eroded, the patient will present to you with mainly intermittent vertigo along with sensory neural hearing loss. Because the inner ear is involved, they will present to you with sensory neural hearing loss and not as conductive hearing loss. They do not present to you with ear discharge, they present to you with mainly intermittent vertigo. So the presentation is intermittent vertigo with sensory neural hearing loss. Now fistula is there, there is a hole, there is a communication between the middle ear and inner ear. So should we close and repair that fistula? Yes, so surgical intervention will be the definitive treatment. You cannot treat this with medical therapy because the hole or the communication between middle ear and inner ear will not close. You will have to do a surgery for the repair. So the answer is surgical intervention is the only definitive treatment. Okay, so I think everyone's understood about this image. Let's go to the next one. The image shows Lefort 1 fracture, Lefort 2 fracture, Lefort 3 fracture or Lefort 4 fracture. What is the image showing? So you are seeing that the fracture line is running horizontally or transverse from floor of the nose and floor of the maxillary sinus. So here is where your maxillary sinus will be. So if the fracture line is running from the floor of the nose and floor of the maxillary sinus, we call it as a Lefort 1 fracture. So what is Lefort 1 fracture? Also called as transverse fracture, also called as horizontal fracture, also called as Gurin's fracture. Why do we call it as Gurin's fracture? Because whenever there is a fracture across the palate, the greater palatine artery can get ruptured and results in a bluish discoloration of the palate. And that bluish discoloration of the palate, we call it as Gurin's sign. And that is why we call it as Gurin's fracture. Now here, they will have a hanging palate because the palate is getting disconnected. You will have a hanging palate and hanging teeth. So hanging palate, and hanging teeth are features of Gurin's fracture, also called as your Lefort's 1 fracture. So the image is showing to you Lefort's 
one fracture if they would have given you an image like this a pyramidal fracture it would be leaf for two where you'll get a hanging maxilla and if they would have given you a fracture like this going from the naseon medial wall of the orbit floor of the orbit lateral wall of the orbit and zygoma separating the cranial cavity from the facial skeleton which we call it as craniofacial disjunction it is your leaf for three fractures we don't have leaf for four there is only three types horizontal fracture is your leaf for fracture so the image was showing you the leaf for one fracture okay let's go to the next question all the following are diagnostic criteria of the disease shown except so there is a disease in the scan you are supposed to know what is the criteria used for diagnosing the disease so which one is not a part of that criteria the options are areas of high attenuation on ct scan or vital invasion allergic eosinophilic mucin type 1 hypersensitivity reaction yes so if you see radiologically there is one specific thing that you see here there are areas which are there are areas which are you know grayish in color and areas which are black in color and areas which are white in color so there is different densities some are white some are gray some are dark gray some are light gray and some things are black so if it appears black it means there is air in the sinus if it appears dark gray light gray whitish it's all suggestive to you of a disease so if you are getting double densities two or more densities we call it as double densities so double densities are suggestive to you of a very important condition which is called as allergic fungal rhinosinusitis so in afrs allergic fungal rhinosinusitis we get this double densities and for that we have a criteria which is called as bent and coons criteria so the name of the criteria is called as bent and coons criteria for allergic fungal rhinosinusitis so what does that criteria says you just have to know the full form allergic fungal rhino sinusitis allergic whenever i say allergy should there be an elevation in serum ige yes so serum ige is elevated when i say fungal should the koh mount be positive yes the koh mount should be positive which will tell you that it is fungal we can even take fungal culture but koh mount or fungal stain the results are available immediately whereas fungal culture takes quite some time so we do not take fungal culture in our results we take koh mount or any fungal stain positivity in our criteria when i say rhino sinusitis indicating rhinitis and sinusitis will you have allergic mucin yes there is allergic mucin in the nose then typically whenever we talk of rhino sinusitis which has been there chronically will there be nasal polyposis yes and typically what did we see fifth one radiologically do we have a very specific appearance which we call it as double density okay so these features where elevation of serum ige is seen is your first point second point is koh mount suggesting of fungal allergic mucin suggesting to you that there is a uh, there is a rhinitis and a sinusitis nasal polyposis telling to you that chronic inflammation has led to polyp and radiological features this criteria is called as bent and coons criteria for afrs now when i am saying allergic it is not invasive so fungal sinusitis can be of two forms non invasive and invasive this comes under non invasive fungal sinusitis it is not an invasive form it is a non invasive form of fungal sinusitis so will you see areas of high attenuation on the ct scan true areas of high and low attenuation which we call it as uh double densities invasion is afrs allergic and invasive disease no it's not invasive so this is false will you see allergic eosinophilic mucin in the nose because of rhinitis and sinusitis yes and when we say allergic should there be a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction yes 
So all of them are true except orbital invasion because it comes as a non-invasive fungal sinusitis. And when we say non-invasive, it doesn't involve orbit, doesn't involve brain. So it is a non-invasive form of fungal sinusitis. Okay, let's go to the next question. A patient presented with a complication of CSOM, the clinical finding is given below. The find, what does this finding tell you? This is a subperiosteal abscess, is this Bezold's abscess, is this Lux abscess or is this Sitelli's abscess? So can you tell me what abscess is this? If this is the mastoid bone, there is a muscle attached from the sternum going to the mastoid, from the sternoclavicular joint to be more specific. What is that muscle? Yes, that muscle is your sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now, if you have a swelling in the sternocleidomastoid muscle following CSOM, so following CSOM, if you're getting a swelling, you will think of a mastoiditis resulting in this abscess. So what will be the name of the abscess when there is pus in the sternocleidomastoid muscle? Very good. We call it as Bezold's abscess. So Bezold's abscess is pus in the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Which is the most common type of an abscess? Post auricular abscess. So the pus breaks the mastoid and lies behind the pinna. That is the most common which is your post auricular abscess. So post auricular abscess is the most common form of abscess. What is Lux abscess and Sitelli's abscess? Very easy to remember. The alphabet that comes after L is M. So, meatal abscess, external auditory meatus, if there is an abscess, we call it as Lux abscess. C is following up with D. So, digastric abscess is going to be your Sitelli's abscess. So, if you have a pus here near the posterior belly of digastric, you call it as uh, Sitelli's abscess. So, L, M, Lux is meatal, Sitelli's is digastric. So the one that has been shown to you is in the sternocleidomastoid muscle. So the name of this abscess in the sternocleidomastoid muscle, we call it as Bezold's abscess. Okay, so let's go to the next image. A patient presented with a tympanic membrane perforation. Otoscopic examination is given below. The perforation is caused due to which of the following? Trauma. Tuberculosis, Epstein Barr virus, Cryptococcus neocomas. Yes. What is the answer? I'm sure most of you would have got it right. You see, there is a perforation and the tympanic membrane has been reflected out like a flap because the hole has occurred because of trauma. How do we know it is trauma? You can see blood in the external auditory canal. The edges of the perforation have got everted and is coming out as a flap. So you can see here the flap of mucosa that has ruptured has been reflected out. So this is suggestive of a traumatic perforation. The other closest that people will get confused in the examination is there are two perforations. So you will think that this is tuberculosis. So multiple perforations can occur in trauma also, but if there is fresh blood, if you see that the edges are inverted and you see that there could be history of trauma in your clinical setting, then you have to answer trauma. But if you get multiple perforations without any blood, edges are most likely healed, then you should think about tuberculosis. Okay, so here the image is showing to you traumatic perforation. Okay, let's go to the next question. There is a patient whose local examination findings are given to you. There is a swelling over the nose extending from the nasion. Swelling on the nose extending from the nasion to the supratip from one nasolabial fold to another nasolabial fold with splaying of the nasal bone. What is this cause due to? And they're telling to you very pert you know, typically that there is a woody nodular consistency to this swelling. So whenever you get the word woody, what would you think of? You will think of one infection. Which infection you have to answer? The cause of that infection. Is this fresh bacillus which is gram positive? Fresh bacillus which is gram negative? Peris bacillus which is gram positive? Peris bacillus which is gram negative? So what we are talking about here 
is rhinoscleroma. So rhinoscleroma is a granulomatous infection in the nose caused by Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis. What is Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis? Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis is a gram negative bacillus also called as Frisch bacillus. So the answer is Frisch bacillus which is gram negative. There is another condition called as atrophic rhinitis which is caused by Klebsiella oziana. So Peri's bacillus is nothing but Klebsiella oziana. It is also gram negative and it is responsible for causing atrophic rhinitis. Now, how do we know we are talking about rhinoscleroma? Because they have given you the very important finding, woody heart consistency. So, when you see woody heart consistency, you must think about rhinoscleroma, which is nothing but a gram-negative infection caused by Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis, also called as fish bacillus. Okay, let's go to the next image. The following test is done for evaluation of Cheek tenderness in maxillary sinusitis, abnormality of the nasal valves, severity of proptosis, skin pinch for dehydration. So what does this test tell you? So here you are saying that it is not done for sinusitis because when we are eliciting maxillary sinus uh, tenderness, we will use both the fingers and press like this on the canine fossa. If the patient winces in pain on pressing, we don't do unilateral testing, we do bilateral testing. And the thumb is used, not the index finger and the middle finger. So with the thumb you press to see the tenderness and it is bilateral. So this is not a test done to elicit maxillary sinus tenderness. This test that you see is called as Cottle's test. So Cottle's test is a test where the patient is asked to breathe in and breathe out. The patient says I'm having left sided nasal obstruction. Then you pull the cheek away. Breathe in and breathe out. On pulling the cheek away, if there is an improvement in breathing, that tells you that there is an abnormality of the internal nasal valve. So, Cottle's test will test the patency of internal nasal valve. Internal nasal valve is the narrowest portion of the nasal cavity. So, what is the narrowest portion? Internal nasal valve. It is bounded medially by septum, superiorly by lower border of upper lateral cartilage and laterally by the inferior turbinate. So medially it is bounded by septum, superiorly by lower border of upper lateral cartilage and laterally by the inferior turbinate. The angle that is present here at the level of internal nasal valve is 10 to 15 degrees. So any abnormality of the internal nasal valve is tested by which test? It is tested by your portals test and I have demonstrated portals test. So for proptosis you are going to use an exaphthalmometer to see how much is the proptosis and for skin pinch for dehydration you usually will test on the abdomen but not on the face or especially here to see you not you'll pinch you'll not just press so pinch you will do for a dehydration so this is not a test for assessing the skin pinch as well. Okay, so let's go to the next question. <clears throat> the image shows which of the following being performed. Indirect laryngoscopy and the spatula test. Posterior rhinoscopy and the spatula test. Indirect laryngoscopy and spatula test. Anterior rhinoscopy and spatula test. So very important, look is there tongue depressor or not and look what is the direction of mirror. It is facing upwards. So whenever you have a tongue depressor and when you have a mirror facing upwards, the structures that you want to visualize is from above, the posterior end of the nose and the nasopharynx. So this is going to be your posterior rhinoscopy. Okay, so this is your posterior rhinoscopy. What is the second test? A tongue depressor is held in front of the patient's nose and the patient is asked to breathe out. If there is equal misting on the tongue depressor, it means that the airflow in both the nasal cavities are equal. But if there is an unequal misting, it means that there is some obstruction like a deviated nasal septum, a polyp, something is obstructing and as a result, there is reduced misting on one side and there is increased misting on another side. So the test that you see here is called as posterior rhinoscopy and the spatula test.
okay so for direct indirect laryngoscopic examination we will never use a tongue depressor instead we will put the tongue out and hold the tongue to perform the test so tongue is pulled out in a indirect laryngoscopic examination so this is not an indirect laryngoscopic test or an anterior rhinoscopic test so the test is posterior rhinoscopy and spatula test okay another very important image that many a times has repeated in the exam this is an endoscopic picture of the nasopharynx identify the marked area it is the most common site of origin for so they have marked this yellow structure what is this yellow structure and what is it most common site for so if we see the whitish marked structure this is the opening of eustachian tube in the nasopharynx this eustachian tube is covered by a cushion this cushion is called as torus tuberius behind that there is a recess this recess is called as fossa of rosenmuller so eustachian tube torus tuberius and fossa of rosenmuller are the structures that you see in the lateral wall of the nasopharynx now fossa of rosenmuller is the most common site of origin for nasopharyngeal carcinoma so where does npc originate from fossa of rosenmuller so the answer is nasopharyngeal carcinoma now look at this image they are giving to you a ct finding in a case of coenal atresia what will you see will you see thickened vomer will you see bowing of the lateral wall of nose fusion in the elements of the region of coena or all of the above so we know this is our septum this posterior portion of the septum is nothing but your vomer so if there is a thickening of the vomer would it reduce the space of your coena yes it will reduce the space of the coena so thickened vomer can it be a cause of coenal atresia yes second thing if there is excessive bowing of the lateral wall of the nose so this is your lateral wall of the nose if it bows excessively what will happen again will it reduce the coenal space yes it will reduce and if there is fusion of the medial wall and lateral wall what will happen is the nose communicating with the nasopharynx no so all the three are responsible for causing coenal atresia thickened vomer bowing of the lateral wall of the nose and fusion in the region of coena all of them are responsible for causing coenal atresia okay that's your answer a 20 year old female presented with a swelling around the eyes since one day there is prior history of cold nose block and a and the present condition was preceded by a urti which sinus infection could have had resulted in the present condition of the patient maxillary frontal ethmoid or sphenoid so typically you are seeing that there is unilateral involvement unilateral redness and edema so you will think about orbital cellulitis and orbital cellulitis it was is the most common complication of the ethmoid sinus so ethmoid sinus are present near your medial canthus between the middle turbinate and the medial wall of the orbit so orbital complications or specifically orbital cellulitis upper and lower eyelid edema both occur secondary to ethmoidal sinusitis and how do i know ethmoidal sinusitis because they are giving to you history of fever they are giving to you history of recurrent cold nose block and now they telling it was preceded by a, by a urti all of this are suggestive to me that there is a sinus infection and the sinus infection that results in orbital cellulitis involving both upper and lower eyelid is your ethmoid sinus okay so that was the last question for all of you i hope you guys enjoy doing this session and i'm extremely sorry for that interruption during the live session although i did not uh, i mean that that was something that was not under my control but uh, what i could do the best was to immediately record and share the session with all of you i hope you guys enjoyed if you have any doubts anything please feel free to reach me and i'll be more than happy to help you take care and bye bye